Book of Philippians, chapter 4. Paul wrote this letter, and when we opened the book of Philippians, we knew and we read that it was written by Paul the Apostle, and he wrote to all the saints in Philippi. He didn't write to his favorite saints in Philippi. He didn't write to the leadership in Philippi. He didn't write to those who were really doing good in the Lord to Philippi. He didn't write to those who were struggling in their walk with Christ in Philippi. He didn't write to those who had walked away from the Lord for a period of time. He wrote to all. This was a a letter that he wrote to every believer in Philippi. He didn't consider or take into thought, you know, well, what condition are you in or, or, or how is your walk or what is your position? He just wrote to everybody because we're, wherever we stand in Christ, we're in Christ. And that's what he recognized. He didn't make anybody special. He didn't condemn anybody for not being who he thinks they should be. He wrote to all the saints, all the Christians in Philippi. Something I, I always encourage in us. It's so easy for us as Christians to, to walk our life and envy some because we're aware of their close relationship and kind of frown at others as far as they call themselves Christians. Uh, and, and it's a very tempting place that the enemy always tries to pull us. But Paul says, I'm writing to the Christians. Okay, I don't, I'm not questioning where they are in Christ. That's not my job, Paul was basically saying. My, Paul is, my job is to present Christ and point them to Christ and encourage them in Christ. And this is exactly what he had done. He wrote this letter to all the saints, all the Christians in Philippi, and he's been expressing uh, his love for them, and he's been encouraging them. And he says, listen, to live as Christ, if you wake up in the morning and you have breath, the reason you have breath is for Christ. It's not for you. It's not for you to, oh, this is the day I get to go to the store and get this for myself. If you have breath, it's for Christ. And so he's telling them and he's encouraged all of them and all of us to live as Christ. There's no other reason for us to live but Christ. And he encouraged them to be of one mind and to be of one accord to to, and he says, and you do this, you, you have this one mind and this one uh, uh, accord by humbling yourself, not by coming up to somebody else and saying, you need to square it away. You need to straighten up. You need to make changes. He says, no, no, no. You want the oneness? You want to have that one mind and that one accord? Then humble yourself. Deal with yourself. He told them, he says, listen, let's each esteem others better than ourselves. And he encouraged them, he says, and, and, and then just press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God that is in Christ Jesus. So he, you can just see as he penned this letter, his heart was poured into it. And he makes no distinctions. He does name a couple of names in chapter 4 just as an example as far as, listen, these particular individuals were at odds with one another. And, and then he was pointing everyone to the oneness and the one mind and the one purpose and working together. So this has been a great letter that Paul wrote. And he wrote again that we would be encouraged in Christ. He had a, he had a tremendous love. This was one of the most personal letters that Paul wrote. And he wrote the majority of the New Testament of the epistles. He now closes his letter by telling them how blessed and excited he is that they were so caring for him through their giving and taking care of, of him. So let's read our text, or the first part of our text. Uh, Philippians chapter 4, we'll begin in verse 10. He says, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress 
Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me according, I mean, with me concerning giving and, and receiving, but only you. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all and, and abound. I am full having received from Epaphroditus the thing sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Father, as we open your word, Father, Lord, let us see the depth of the passion and the depth of the love and the depth of the care and the depth of the fellowship that Paul pens this with through your spirit, Lord. Father, may we as a, as a body of believers see the importance and the need and the joy and the grace of togetherness and encouraging one another. So Father, bless this time as we open your word together. In Jesus' name, amen. It says here, Paul says that he was blessed and he was celebrating and rejoicing in the Lord because the Christians in Philippi were caring for him. He didn't have the attitude, you better, or you're supposed to. He just, he's just blessed and rejoicing and celebrating. He's not referring, to, he, he is referring to, I'm sorry, he's referring to material things he needed here. In fact, in verse 18, he refers to them as things he received from them. Could have been clothing, could have been food, could have been books, could have been money, could have been all of those things. He was not. He was not referring to the spiritual things like prayer or encouragement or scriptures. He wasn't against that. But, but when he is celebrating here and rejoicing, he's, he's rejoicing in the material things that the Philippians had supplied for him. The Philippians had always, had always cared for Paul. He says in our text that when he went to Macedonia and planted the church in Philippi and a few other places, he says, when I left uh, Mesopotamia, you were, the, you were the only church that supported me. You were the only ones that took care of me. Those in Macedonia the others, whoever they were, we don't really have a record of all the different churches. He says, but you guys were the only ones you took care of me when I left. In fact, Paul was boasting to the Corinthian church when he wrote to the Corinthians about the churches of Macedonia, which would have been Philippi. Macedonia is a region. Uh, Philippi is a city. It's like we are in West Covina, a part of the, the San Gabriel Valley. Same type of an idea here as far as Macedonia was a region and uh, Philippi was a part of that region or a city in that region. But he was boasting to the Corinthians about, about what the Philippians had, had done for him. He, he writes to them in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. He says, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in a great tri uh, trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. He, he's, he's boasting to the Corinthians that the church of Philippi, they just, they took care of us. And, and as we read there in, in 2 Corinthians, they, they were not a rich church. They were described as being in deep poverty, yet they gave beyond their ability. This is such an act of love, you guys. Uh, it's, it's our love for God. And it's our love for God's people. And it's our love for the people that serve the Lord. This is, 
this is an amazing thing that, that you gave out of grace and love. Again, it isn't like they had all this money in the bank and they cut a chunk of it for Paul and them. He says, no, they were in deep poverty. This was a struggling church. These were struggling people. And yet they gave beyond their abilities. Have you ever found yourself in that place to where, you know, the Lord lays something on your heart and it's like, well, we don't really have the money for that. We really can't pull that off. And, 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 and that's where they found themselves. But they said, but the Lord laid it on our hearts. And, and in their love for God and their faith and their trust in God and in their love for God's people and the servants of the Lord, they gave whatever it was, whether it was food, whether it was clothing, whether it was money, whatever it was. This is why it is important for us to do what the Lord lays on our hearts. It shows our love for the Lord and for his people. When God lays things on our hearts and brings things to us, it's, it's our listening to God and, and Lord, I love you. And therefore, absolutely. And I love your people. And, and therefore, we follow through. And you must understand that often people keep their needs to themselves. They don't openly walk around with the sign saying, I need a pair of shoes, um, nine and a half, depending on the shoes, 10 sometimes work, uh, prefer black. Uh, they, they don't know. We don't know what their needs are. We have no idea if they've had meals for the last week. We have no idea if they even have a jacket as the cold weather up, uh, uh, comes towards us because their position is, Lord, I'm coming to you. And I'm asking you, Lord, to help me, to feed me, to guide me, to provide for me, to open doors for me, to close doors for me. They're coming to God. They lift their needs to the Lord in the faith that God will meet their needs. And here's the exciting thing. God meets their needs through us. And so when God lays something on our hearts, it should never be taken lightly. Like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's like they're coming to God and saying, God, please provide for me. Take care of whatever the situation may be. God then comes to us and says, listen, I want you to go over there and give this to them. And, 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 and so we say, okay. And then we go and we give it to them. It's so important. God was sharing with these Philippians, the Christians in Philippi, Paul needs help. It wasn't Paul penning letter after letter. Uh, hello, my stuff, my needs. He, he went to God. And, and so it's so important for you and I to be that sensitive to God in our walks. And I've, I've shared this before, and it's something that, that I, I pray that we take to heart. When God blesses us, we have to ask why. And we have to be honest. It's never because we deserve it. Okay, it's because of his grace, but we have to ask God if God was to dump something into our, our hands, if somebody was to give us a car, you know, do we even need a car? I don't know, but I've got an extra one. Um, or do we say for what, for who, what do I do with the old one? If the new one's better, the old one's not bad, but you know, understand what I'm saying. It's like, God will speak to us. He doesn't just speak to specific people. I don't talk to him. And I don't, this one, they listen. I always talk to them. He talks to all of us. And it's important for us to obey the things that God is sending on our heart because I don't know about you. It excites me that I could actually be a part of an answering of God's prayers to somebody else. They're praying for something and, and God has laid it on my heart and I get to be a part of, of God blessing them. God uses us to meet other people's needs. But our text says that for a while, the Philippians lacked opportunity to send care to Paul. He, he makes the statement in our text that he, he, he again, that, that he's excited and he's blessed that, that they again are able to help because they were un able for a while. They didn't have the opportunity. We're not told what caused the lack of opportunity. Perhaps it was they didn't have the means to help. Perhaps they didn't have uh, anybody to take and supply or, or carry the supplies to Paul. We're not really told why, but we are told that eventually Epaphroditus was able to go and to take the things that Paul needed. And, and Paul was blessed. 
In fact, in verse 18, he refers to these things that were given to him as a sweet smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well pleasing to God. Paul is letting them know God's pretty excited and blessed and joyed that you did this. It was sweet to God. Paul was obviously saying sweet to him too. He he needed the things that were given to him. But he says, you guys blessed me, you blessed God, and and God is pleased as I am pleased. And and this is why it's important for us, you guys. It, it, It pleases God. It shows our obedience to God. God uses the church and the people of the church to support God's work and God's workers. And I encourage us all, to be open to the Lord, to move us to support God's work and to support God's workers. We don't, we don't have to be rich. It doesn't have to be a large amount. It's just being open to the Lord, just simply being open to the Lord and, and what he has set before us. It's, you know, the time when Jesus was with his disciples and Jesus knew that this woman gave a couple of pennies and, and he says, so who gave the most? The wealthy people who gave a couple thousand dollars or the lady who gave two pennies? And our, our minds would immediately go, well, the couple thousand out trumps two pennies. But he says, no, nah, that's not true. She gave all. All she had was two pennies. She walked out of church with nothing. The others gave out of their abundance. There's nothing wrong with giving out of abundance. But it, the point that Christ was making, it's, it's not the amount, it's the heart. And so when God lays his work or individuals on our hearts, I encourage us all to obey. It blesses those we give. It blesses the Lord because we obey. And it blesses us because we get the joy of being a part of God's work. But also. If you, if you are one of God's workers, please take note to be open, to be open to God working through his people. If you're seeking the Lord and, and coming before the Lord and laying out a need before the Lord, and all of a sudden you get a knock on the door, or you get something in the mail, or you get something delivered, recognize it's the Lord and, and receive the gift as acceptable from God. Acknowledge and accept the gift. It's not always easy. And and you may sit back and think, well, well, of course, it's not always easy. It's very humbling when when God lays it on somebody's heart to to help you. And it's like, you know, your your pride steps in. It's like, no, I don't need it. I don't need it, man. And, and, And Paul was their teacher. Paul was their leader. And he acknowledged and accepted their gift. He didn't tell them, "Uh, I'm praying for God to meet my needs. I didn't ask for your help. I didn't want you to be involved. Paul acknowledged and recognized this is God working through them. And so I'm seeking God to meet my needs. God lays it on somebody's heart. Somebody comes and offers it and I go, oh, no, 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 no. That's okay. That's okay. I don't need it. I don't need it. God's like, really? You've been asking me for two weeks for that. And, and I finally lay it on someone's heart and they are finally obedient and they give it to you. No, 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 no. Cause it didn't fall from heaven. Why would we do that? And, and so I, I know it may sound strange, but, but it's necessary and important for us to accept God's answering and God's gifts. However, he chooses to fulfill our prayers and and answer our prayers and and meet our needs. And I also want to recognize here, please take note that even even though they lacked opportunity to meet Paul's needs for a period of time, we don't know how long, Paul never complained. He didn't write another letter going, hello, I wrote you a letter a couple months ago about my needs and nothing. He wasn't begging them, come on, guys. I mean, I, I know you've been faithful all along, and I appreciate that, but I'm again, and nobody else is stepping up. It's just you guys. And, and so please, he wasn't begging. He wasn't worried. 
like, I don't know, man, it's getting laid and things are unfolding and things are happening. And I still, he wasn't fretting over anything. And yet his needs for such a period of time were not actually being met, but he wasn't begging or complaining or worried. Why? Because Paul had learned that in whatever state he was in, to be content. For whatever reason, God wants me to be poor right now. Why would God want us to be poor? I don't know. But Paul was in that position. I'm here not because of my failures or my mishaps or my misjudgments or my mistakes. I'm here because this is where God wants me, and I'm experiencing this because this is what God wants me to experience, and I accept that. This is something that, that especially, especially I believe leaders need to learn, that, that we have to be willing to be content with and without, to be in abundance and to be in loss, to be hungry and to be full. It's, there's this mentality, and there's even a teaching that if you aren't full, then you're not really walking with God because we're God's kids. And as God's children, he always blesses us. And so if you are lacking anything, you're having a problem with your heavenly father and he's rejecting you or because you're not positive enough or because you're not active enough or because you're not this enough or perhaps you're too much of that. And, and there's this thing that our physical being here is, and, and blessings here determines our relationship with God. Boy, if that was the case, Jesus was all messed up. He openly says, I don't even have a place to lay my head. You know, you guys, the sun sets, everybody goes home and goes to bed. Yeah, I don't have a home, let alone a bed, to go lay my head on. Well, he must have been all messed up. No, not quite. He was as perfect as perfect comes. So Christians and leaders, we need to understand that our Physical condition is not the determining of our relationship. Our physical have and have nots is not the determination of our relationship with God. I, I know of, of people, I know of Christians who believe that I am totally blessed of God, they say, because I've got all kinds of stuff. Okay, I, I got a new house, I got a pool, I've got a slide into my pool, I got a rocks around my pool, I've got two cars, I have a boat, I have a motorcycle, I have a quad. Yeah, I am blessed. God loves me. And yet, to listen to them talk and the foul language and the attitude and, and the meanness is like, wow. But the convincing factor is stuff. And then it's reversed the other way. We see somebody in, in poverty and struggling. It's like, man, if they'd only repent of whatever it is that put them there. Because this ain't right. God is just not showering them. And there's got to be a reason why. And, and Paul is, states this for all of us to understand. It's not based on our stuff that we have or we don't have. It's based on our belief in God. And whatever he chooses to do with us, Paul said, I'm good with that. I don't believe contentment comes naturally to any of us Christians. It doesn't matter how much we have. We generally want more, right? I mean, if he's blessed us with this, it's, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. And then we kind of go, but you know what? I mean, I'm not complaining. That's nicer. Okay, I, I would like that. We always get mad at our, our kids or, or grandkids. As Christmas rolls around, what do you want for Christmas? They tell us, we go out, we save, we buy, we give it to them, and a month later, they're done. And it's like, no, you got to play with that for a whole year, okay? Because Christmas isn't coming for another year, and you ain't getting a new one for another year. And we're just, we're always looking. Companies depend on that, okay? If if you have an iPhone 3, what's wrong with you? We're up to 9 or 10 now, aren't we? Okay, does a 3 take phone calls? Uh-huh. Does a 3 send texts? Uh-huh. Does a 3 allow you to go onto the internet? Uh-huh. But you want, what are we up to? 12, 11, whatever. Uh, you know, wouldn't a 12 be nice? Okay, and so we're just never content. You know, and, and it's like, Paul, contentment is something we have to learn. 
And Paul even states, he says, he says that he has learned how to be content. So what did Paul do to enable him to be content in whatever state? To have food and not have food. To have clothing and not have clothing. How did he learn to be content with that? He learned, folks. He didn't concentrate on contentment. He learned to believe in the Lord completely. He learned to trust the Lord completely. His his belief and his faith wasn't in his contentment. His belief and his faith was in his God and in his Lord Jesus Christ. And he learned that in all things are done through Christ who strengthens us. It's not done through money. It's not done through people. It's not done through anything else. All things are done through Christ who strengthens us. God may use money and God may use people, but he is not. God has never been dependent on money or people, and neither should we. We just, we have to be open to the fact that God absolutely knows what he's doing. Even if it's what we don't like, he knows what he's doing. Folks, he is God. He has created us. He has created everything that we can look at around here. And we may say, well, no, man built these buildings. Well, God gave them the the abilities and the materials and the skills and the hands and the arms and the legs to build that building. Okay, eliminate God from the picture. You got no buildings. You got nothing. He's the creator of all things. So he knows what he's doing. So listen, folks, no matter how tight it gets or no matter how close it gets to the the dangerous point, we are not to depend on people to provide. We are always to depend on the Lord to provide. He may use people. He may use finances. He may use money. But it's not the people that are our answers. You guys remember the story of Esther? where there was the plan to, to destroy all of the, the children of Israel, all of the, the nation of Israel, all of the Jewish people. And, and God had placed Esther to be queen. Okay, and so her, her uncle uh, Mordecai went to her and says, listen, you got to talk to the king. You got you to gotta save us. We're all about to die here. And she said, oh, no, I, I can't. You know, it's not like, you know, hey, it's not like, you know, he's my husband. And I just like, hey, what are you doing tonight when we go to bed tonight? You know, I got a couple things. She said, I'm not even allowed to go talk to him unless he asks for me to come and talk to him. So if I go into his chamber and say, hey, can I talk to you? Um, I could lose my head. It's not as simple. It's not a, a typical, normal kind of marriage that you may be thinking of. A lot of people know and understand that, that a wife has a lot of power in the home, okay? And, and, and so, you know, it's, she's saying, yeah, not this home, okay? I, I can't, if I go to him and uninvited, I could die. And listen to what Mordecai answers her in Esther 4.14. He says, if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. He's basically telling her, it's not like he needs you. He's going to use you, but it's not like God's going, what if Esther says no? Oh my gosh, what if Esther, what if she's all caught up in herself here and and afraid? What if Esther says no? What are we going to do? He lets her know, listen, this is an opportunity that God has given you. He's opened the doors and placed you in here. I know you think you're there because you're all pretty and everything, which was an instrument that was used. Truth be told, Mordecai is telling her, you're there because God placed you there. But if you're going to be rebellious, and you're going to say, I'm not going to endanger my life for all my people, that's fine. God will deliver his people from another place. He'll raise up somebody else. He'll do something else. It's not like you've now backed God into a corner. So God uses people. God uses money. God uses things, but he never depends on them. Therefore, we have to understand 
that I can get through this time of need. I can get through this time of change. I can get through this time of trial. I can get through this time of persecution. I can get through this time of plenty. Having plenty will not pull me away from trusting the Lord. I can get through any of this because I can do all things through Christ because he strengthens me. It's Christ. Listen, folks, I want to comment on our current situation in America right now. Uh, Our country is going through a lot right now. And it's very possible that there are some major changes coming. It's even possible that we are about to face some hard persecution against the church. And I know this may scare some of you. And it may even anger some of you. But you got to take our text and put it into play. Just as the Lord has been with us through our freedom here in America, if that changes, he'll be with us through any changes and through any persecution that comes our way. And I've heard a lot of people angry at the church as far as, you know, uh, if all the Christians just vote, then it'll go this way. If all the Christians stay home, then it's going to go that way. And if it doesn't go the way that we think it should go, then obviously the Christian has failed. And we're putting all of our opinions into man. As if God says, listen, if every Christian isn't praying, then I ain't answering. If there's only like a couple thousand that are seeking me, yeah, it's not enough. God has us. He really does. God is a God of righteousness. God is a God of purity. God is a God of holiness. God is a God of righteousness. And God will judge where judgment needs to come. He really, really will. And we've been saying for years, uh, people have been making statements for years. If God does not judge San Francisco, California, America, then he owes Sodom and Gomorrah an apology. And if God is actually moving towards that right now, we're all up in arms. I mean, we've, you know, used to say we deserve it. And now it's like, what? What? And I'm not saying we're heading that way. All I'm saying, if, if this heads that way, we're still okay. God is still God. He is still with us. He will still take us through and sustain us and strengthen us. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. What does that mean? It means he'll enable us. It means that, let's say it gets crazy, 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 crazy. And they actually start physically putting Christians to death. God's word says, I'll strengthen you through that. I I got to tell you, and I've said this before, when, when ISIS was, was killing the Christians and, oh, over there in the Middle East and they were lining them up and, and, and beheading them and stuff, I was angry. And I just thought, oh, Lord, how, how do these, why aren't these guys fighting? If they know they're about to die, go down fighting. And, and God, share with me, but it's, but it's not my will. I, I, I'm actually using this to convict those crazies in hopes that they'll maybe surrender. Yeah, no, they're too hard. They won't surrender. They possibly won't surrender. But I want to give them that opportunity. In my mind, oh, they don't deserve an opportunity. Okay, they need to go to hell right now. And God says, well, that's why I'm God and you're not. But I, I question, how, how do they do that? What would I do? What would I do if, if they lined me up with some other Christians and, and they were about to behead us? And here's what I know. And here's what I stand on. Do I want to face that? No, I don't. But if I do, here's what I know. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. God will give me the strength right then and there to either say something if I'm supposed to or close my mouth if I'm supposed to. And that would have to be God to close my mouth. But that's my faith in God. And, and I, I don't need that right now, you guys, because no one's threatening me. So it's almost in my mind like a waste of faith if God gives me that faith now because I don't really need it right now. 
But I do know this. If I were to ever face that, I, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That was Paul's comment. He wasn't saying, well, now that you've relieved me and given me help, now I can see. He said, I've been hungry. I've been full. I've had stuff. I've been without stuff. It doesn't matter because I know that God is always going before me. And I know that God will enable me to, to not eat for 30 days if necessary or to, to glutton myself for 30 days in preparation for the next day. Whatever. God can do all things. And therefore, I trust him that through him, I can do all things. And so Paul is thankful and celebrating and rejoicing in what they've given him and how they've supplied for him. But he says, you know, it, it's, I, I, I wasn't whining and I wasn't complaining and I wasn't griping and I wasn't begging. I just trusted God. He's pretty excited that they supplied his needs. He accepted it and enjoyed it, whatever it was. But he's not just excited because they cared for him and supported him. Verse 17 says he was excited for their sakes, for the Philippians' sakes. He was excited because they were being led by the Lord and they were obedient to the Lord, meaning their caring and giving was a part of their relationship with the Lord. This is what excited Paul. It's like, I knew you guys loved the Lord. I knew you, you had your, your faith in God. And, and the mere fact that you don't have it, yet you gave it, is the evidence that you totally trust God. Their caring and giving was producing fruit in their life, in their relationship with God. As Paul had boasted to the Corinthians, as we read in, in chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians, he goes on in, in 2 Corinthians 8, 7, he says, but as you excel in everything, now he's speaking to the, he's giving the example as far as the, the Philippians there took care of me, even though they didn't have a lot of money. Corinth was a rich church. And he says, and, and, and they were faithful in, in, in meeting my needs and giving the gifts and whatever it was. After he says that, he says, but as you excel in everything in faith, Corinthians had a lot of faith in speech. They were very bold in knowledge, in all earnestness, and, and in your love for us. See that you excel in this act of grace also. The giving, the caring, the coming alongside. He's referring to the caring and the giving. You know, that's why he brought up the Philippians. He's telling the Corinthians, you guys have been blessed with all this stuff. God bless you. But also excel in the caring for others and the giving for others. Caring and giving is a part of our Christian living. And we need to learn to follow the Lord and trust the Lord in our caring and giving for one another. Referring to our giving, the Lord tells us in Malachi 3.10, he says, and try me now in this about giving, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. He's not, again, just talking about material stuff here. He's talking about the blessings and the joy of the fulfillment of serving God. Have you ever helped somebody? And you walk away going, well, thank you, Lord. That was, that was a blessing. I enjoyed doing that. That's God filling us beyond capacity. God is pleased when we care for his children and give to his children. He'll bless us. He'll take care of us. Caring and giving is an act of obedience. When God lays something on our heart, it's an act of obedience. And it's not always easy. I, I love this story uh, of Elijah and the widow in 1 Kings chapter 17. Uh, just let me read it to you rather than trying to tell you, because it's a beautiful story. Uh, Elijah has, is on the run, if you will, from, from the queen and and we read in, in 1 Kings chapter 17, beginning in verse 8. He says, Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise, go to uh, Zarpath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went to Zarpath. And when he came to the gate of the city, indeed, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Please bring me a little water and a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. Now, let me stop for a second. Think about this. 
God spoke to Elijah and says, go to this city and there's going to be a widow there and I'm going to take care of your needs through hers. So he goes to the city. Sure enough, he meets this widow at the gates and, hey, can you have a glass of water? Yeah, let me go get it for you. Hey, bring me something to eat on the way. Figuring what? She's got plenty. Why? Because God said she's going to meet my needs and so we're good, right? Just She's going to go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll bring you out a plate in just a second. That's not the story. Look at verse 12. So she said, as the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. And see, I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Can you imagine Elijah's thoughts? Wait, 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 wait. You must be the wrong widow. Okay, I mean... (laughs) God said a widow was going to take care of me. And so you're going to get me a glass of water. God bless you. But how about some food? You're saying, no, we've just got a little bit of flour and oil. I'm going to make a little cake for my son and I, and we're going to eat it and then die. That's all we got. When we're done with that, we're done. But Elijah knows that God is faithful. So he goes on, verse 13, and Elijah said to her, do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me, and afterwards make some for yourself and for your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. Pretty bold, huh? Oh, yeah, no, 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 make mine first. I got enough to make two little cakes, one for me and one for my son. We're going to eat them and die. Oh, no, 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 make mine first, and then whatever's left over split between you and your son. What a great godly man. Can you, can you imagine being the widow going, wow, now there's a caring guy, all right? <laughs> um, but he tells her, he, he's, he's not doubting, he's not questioning, he just says, don't worry, God, God said he'll take care of you and me and your son. Would you do it? Would you be faithful? I mean, you know, I want to think that I'd be thinking, well, so I die a couple days earlier because I don't have enough to eat. I I would have eaten this much. Now I only get to eat half of what I was going to eat. So rather than living for a week, I'll probably die in five days. Either way, I'm going to die. I don't know. That's what I like to think I do. But I also know me and I'd probably tell this guy off. Really? Really? Me and my son should die that you may live? But she doesn't question. Verse 15, so she went away and did according to the word of Elijah. And she and he and her household ate for many days. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. Wow. Trusting God leads to faith, which leads to actions of caring and giving. Paul says, and my God will supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I trust God, which leads me to faith because I have a faith in God. I will actually do acts of caring and giving. She had faith in God, which led her to faith. I mean, to to, to action of of doing and trusting God. James tells us in James 2.17, Thus also faith by itself, it does not have work. If it does not have works, it's dead. I got all the faith in the world. But if I don't have works, you said it's meaningless, it's dead. It goes on in James 2.18. I will show you my faith by my works. Oh, yeah, yeah, I have plenty of faith. Well, show me. Oh, just trust me. I got faith, all right? I can do that. Let me see you move that mountain. I could if I want to. I just want to show off right now. But I've got faith to move that mountain. Well, then move it. I don't want to. I'm a humble man. And I don't want to, you know, and, and, and so this is James's point as far as you can sit back and say you've got all the faith in the world. But if you're not doing anything with it, dead faith. So I'll show you my faith in God by the things that I do, the works that I do. We should be showing our faith in the Lord by helping and caring for one another. By coming alongside those that God lays on our hearts. And God, you guys know this. You know God lays people and things and situations on your heart. All of us. There is no exception that God doesn't lay things on our heart. And God is asking that we fulfill the very things because of our faith and our trust in God and do the things that he set before us. 
Paul closes the letter with his final farewell. Verse 20. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever and amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, but especially those who are of Caesar's household. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. I love this. I, I know it's just a basic, you know, talk to you later, see you later type of a thing. He sends his greetings to everyone. And here's the cool part, through everyone. He is encouraging sweet fellowship for everyone. Let me read it again. Greet every saint. He's writing to all the saints to greet every saint in Christ Jesus. And, and us over here, we greet you. You greet us. We're all greeted. So it's, he's, he's asking greetings of everyone through everyone. Folks, it's important for you and I saying hi and God bless you and how are you doing? These are all acts of caring and love. It's, we should all. We are all a part of doing this. Everyone should greet everyone, not just those that I'm familiar with, not just those that I see all the time. We should all be greeting all, all the time. It's a part of our relationship. Paul also sent greetings to everyone in Philippi from everyone with him in Rome. And he says, listen, I'm here in, in Rome penning this, and we're all excited because we're penning it to you, and, and we're sending our greetings to you, all of us, especially the household of Caesar, meaning a lot of Caesar's, the, the, the palace servants and guards were accepting the Lord because they're ecstatic that they're a part of greeting you and letting you in back and forth. And so they've never even seen each other. They will never even meet each other. And yet they're greeting each other and sending love and care back and forth. Paul sent so many letters to the churches because he understood how important and helpful and encouraging fellowship is. He, he penned so many letters because he understood it's important to hear from one another. It's important to encourage one another. It's important to pray for one another. It's important to ask about one another and, and talk to one another. This is so important for us to stay in touch with each other, especially now with this COVID thing going around. And we live in a time that there are so many ways that we can do this. We can call each other on the phone. We can text each other. It's like, you know what? I don't want to call so-and-so because they hang on the phone for days. Then send them a text. All right? And if they send you a long text back, tell them you were busy, you'll get back to them later. We can email each other. We can send cards. We can send letters. Oh, I'm not much of a writer. Then send a card. Find a card that says something gracious and loving and caring and sign your name at the end of it. You do know your name. I would encourage you if you send a card to add a little more than the card. I, I, I got to be, I'm not real good at, at this. And I'm wrong. And I need to make changes. I, I've, I've never been good at cards or anything else. I, I'm not good at phone calls. I'm not good at text. I'll respond to a text. I'll respond to a phone call. I'll respond to a card. I'll respond to a letter so long as you start it. It's not good. And I need to make changes in all of that. And I've been blessed with a great wife who's extremely sensitive to all this. When my parents were alive, did you call your mom and dad today? It's their anniversary. Uh, I was gonna right now before you text. In fact, the reason I didn't call is I'm responding to your text. So I'm putting off the call so I can respond to your text. Uh, I, I, have, I had my parents' birthdays, anniversaries, and everything else on calendars and everything else. It didn't help. Uh, I'm not boasting. I'm wrong. I'm wrong. I'm wrong. And I need to make changes. Because this is for me as well as it is for you. So as we close this very personal and caring and encouraging letter from Paul to the Christians, to all of the Christians in Philippi, let's be doers of the word. Let's begin greeting one another and staying in touch with one another and praying for one another and encouraging one another. That was his point. That was his point. He didn't really rebuke anybody, did he? It was just, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. 
And so he's encouraging us to take advantage of the relationship that we have. And we need to do that with one another, especially during these times. Amen. Father, thank you for bringing us together today and allowing us to open your word. Your word always has answers for us. Lord, the world and the things around us can tempt us and scare us. It can challenge us. It can deceive us. But your word, your word is always solid and truthful and to the point and exact. And so, Father, I pray that all of us will be doers of the word. You've blessed us with a great church. You've blessed us with a great body of believers. You've blessed us, Father, in bringing us together. And there are some who are scared, and there are some who are in need, and there are some who are worried. And so, Lord, may we, as a body of believers, reach out to one another. You've given us so many ways and opportunities of doing this. May we now be the faithful ones and follow your lead and the things that you lay upon our hearts. We're thankful for the book of Philippians, Father. We pray, Lord, that it'll become a part of our everyday life, that we will live in Christ, knowing that we can do all things through Christ because he strengthens us. So let us not fear. Let us not boast. Let us not run except for to you. And so, Father, bless now as we worship and adore you, Father. We lift up our offering before you. We lift up our communion, the bread and the cup before you, Father, as we prepare to remember that this life, this grace, this love was shared with us through Jesus as he gave himself for us. So bless this time as we worship you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship.